So one might ask, where did this all begin, uh, what we have today, uh, really a world in a state of uh, cumulative collapse? You get it started with John Locke, and John Locke introduces property, and he has three provisos for just private right and property. And the three provisos are that there must be enough left over for others and that you must not let it spoil and that you, most of all, must mix your labor with it. It seems justified. You mix your labor with the world, then you're entitled to the product, and as long as there's enough left over for others uh, and as long as it doesn't spoil, you don't allow anything to go to waste, that's okay. Well, he spends a long time of his famous treatise of government, and it's since been the canonical text for economic and political and legal understanding. It's still a, a classic text of study. Well, what he did is, it, after he gives the provisos, and you're almost thinking at the time whether you're for private property or not, he's given a very, a very good and plausible and powerful defense of private property here. Well, he drops them. He drops them like that, right in one sentence. He says, well, once the introduction of money came in by men's tacit consent, then it became, and he doesn't say all the provisos are canceled, they're erased, but that's what happens. So now we have not product and your property earned by your own labor. Oh no, money buys labor now. There's no longer consideration of whether there's enough left over for others. There's no longer consideration of whether it spoils because he says, well, money's like silver and gold and gold can't spoil, therefore money can't be uh, are responsible for waste, which is ridiculous. We're not talking about money and, and silver. We're talking about what its effects are. It's one non sequitur after another. Just the most uh, startling uh, logical ledger domain that he, he gets away with here. But it fits the interests of capital owners. Then Adam Smith comes along, and what he adds is the religion to this lock started with God made it all this way. This is God's right. And now we get also with Smith coming along, he says it's not only God's, I mean, he's not saying this, but this is what's happening philosophically in principle. He's saying it's not only a question of private property. That's all now presupposed as given. And that there's money investors that buy labor given that there's no limit to how much they can buy of other men's labor, how much they can accumulate, how much inequality, that's all given now. And so he comes along and what his big idea is, and again it's just introduced in, in parentheses en, en passant, you know when people put out the, the goods for sale and others, you know, the supply and other people buy them with the, the demand and so forth, how do you, how do we have supply equaling demand or demand equaling supply, how can they come into equilibrium? And that is one of the central notions of economics is how do they come into equilibrium? And he says, it's the invisible hand of the market that brings them into equilibrium. So now we have God is actually imminent. He just didn't give the rights to property and how, uh, you know, all its wherewithal and uh, its natural rights of uh, doing all that Locke said. Now we have the system itself as God. In fact, Smith says when he talks, and you'll never find this quote again, you have to read the whole of the uh, inquiry into the wealth of nations. He says, the scantiness of subsistence sets limits to the reproduction of the poor and that uh, nature can deal with this in no other uh, way than elimination of their children. So he anticipated evolutionary theory in the worst sense. Uh, apply. He, this is well before Darwin. And so he, he called them the race of laborers. So you can see there was inherent racism built in here. There was an ex inherent acceptance, life blindness to kill in innumerable children. And he thought, well, that's the invisible hand making supply meet demand and demand meet supply. So see what, how wise God is. So you can see a lot of the really virulent, this life destructive, eco-genocidal things that are going on now have, uh, in a way, a thought gene uh, back in Smith too. When we reflect on the original concept of the so-called free market capitalist system as initiated by early economic philosophers such as Adam Smith, we see that the original intent of a market was based around real, tangible, life-supporting goods for trade. 
Adam Smith never fathomed that the most profitable economic sector on the planet would eventually be in the arena of financial trading or so-called investment, where money itself is simply gained by the movement of other money in an arbitrary game which holds zero productive merit to society. Yet, regardless of Smith's intent, the door for such seemingly anomalous advents was left wide open by one fundamental tenet of this theory. Money is treated as a commodity in and of itself. Today, in every economy of the world, regardless of the social system they claim, money is pursued for the sake of money and nothing else. The underlying idea, which was mysteriously qualified by Adam Smith with his religious declaration of the invisible hand, is that the narrow, self-interested pursuit of this fictional commodity will somehow magically manifest human and social well-being and progress. The reality is that the monetary incentive interest, or what some have termed the money sequence of value, has now completely decoupled from the foundational life interest, which could be termed the life sequence of value. What has happened is that there's a complete confusion in economic doctrine uh, between those two sequences. They think that the money sequence of value delivers the life sequence of value, that, and that's why they say if more goods are sold, if GDPs rise and so forth, therefore there'd be more well-being, enhanced well-being. We take the GDP to be our basic layer indicator of social health. Well, there you see the confusion. It's talking about money sequences of value, that is all the receipts, all the revenues that are derived from selling uh, goods, uh, and they're confusing that with uh, life reproduction, so that you have built right into this thing from the beginning is a complete conflation of the money and life sequences of value. So we're dealing with a kind of a structured delusion that becomes more and more deadly as the money sequence decouples from producing anything at all. So it's a system disorder, and the system disorder seems to be fatal. In society today, you seldom hear anyone speak of the progress of their country or society in terms of their physical well-being, state of happiness, trust, or social stability. Rather, the measures are presented to us through economic abstractions. We have the gross domestic product, the consumer price index, the value of the stock market, rates of inflation, and so on. But does this tell us anything of real value as to the quality of people's lives? No, all these measures have to do with the money sequence itself and nothing more. For example, the gross domestic product of a country is a measure of the value of goods and services sold. This measure is claimed to correlate to the standard of living of a country's people. In the United States, health care accounted for over 17% of GDP in 2009, amounting to over 2.5 trillion spent hence creating a positive effect on this economic measure. And, based on this logic, it would be even better for the U.S. economy if health care services increased more so, perhaps to $3 trillion or $5 trillion, since that would create more growth, more jobs, and hence boasted by economists as a rise in their country's standard of living. But, wait a minute, what do health care services actually represent? Well, sick and dying people. That's right, the more unhealthy people there are in America, the better the economy. Now, that is not an exaggeration or a cynical perspective. In fact, if we step back far enough, you will realize that the GDP not only doesn't reflect real public or social health on any tangible level, it is, in fact, mostly a measure of industrial inefficiency and social degradation. And the more you see it rise, the worse things are becoming with respect to personal, social and environmental integrity. You have to create problems to create profit. There is no profit under the current paradigm uh, in saving lives, putting balance on this planet, having justice uh, and peace or anything else. There's just no profit there. There's an old saying, pass a law, create a business, whether you're creating a business for a lawyer or whatever. So, you know, crime does create business, just like destruction creates, creates business in Haiti. We have now roughly two million people in, incarcerated 
in this country, and of those, many of them are in prisons run by private corporations, Corrections Corporation of America, Wackenhut, who trade their stock on Wall Street based upon how many people are in jail. Now that's sickness, but that is a reflection of what this economic paradigm calls for. So what exactly does this economic paradigm call for? What is it that keeps our economic system going? Consumption. Or more accurately, cyclical consumption. When we break down the foundation of classic market economics, we are left with a pattern of monetary exchange that simply cannot be allowed to stop or even substantially slowed if the society as we know it is to remain operational. There are three main actors on the economic stage, the employee, the employer, and the consumer. The employee sells labor to the employer for income. The employer sells its production services and hence goods to the consumer for income. And the consumer, of course, is simply another role of the employer and employee, spending back into the system to enable the cyclical consumption to continue. In other words, the global market system is based on the assumption that there will always be enough product demand in society to move enough money around at a rate which can keep the consumption process going. And the faster the rate of consumption, the more so-called economic growth is assumed, and so the machine goes. But hold on. I thought an economy was meant to, I don't know, economize? Doesn't the very term have to do with preservation and efficiency and a reduction of waste? So how does our system, which demands consumption and the more the better, efficiently preserve or economize at all? Well, it doesn't. The intent of the market system is, in fact, the exact opposite of what a real economy is supposed to do, which is efficiently and conservatively orient the materials for production and distribution of life-supporting goods. We live on a finite planet with finite resources, where, for example, the oil we utilize took millions of years to develop, where the minerals we use took billions of years to develop. So having a system that deliberately promotes the acceleration of consumption for the sake of so-called economic growth is pure ecocidal insanity. Absence of waste, that's what efficiency is. Absence of waste. This system is more wasteful than all the other existing systems in the history of the planet. Every level of life organization and life system is in a state of crisis and challenge and decay or collapse. No peer-reviewed journal in the last 30 years uh, will tell you anything different. That is that every life system is in decline as well as social programs, as well as our water access. Try to name any means of life that isn't threatened and in danger. You can. There, isn't, there really isn't one, and that's very, very despairing. But we haven't even figured out the causal mechanism. We don't want to face the causal mechanism. We just want to go on, you know, that's what insanity is, where you keep doing the same thing over and over again, though it clearly doesn't work. So you're really dealing with not an economic system, but I would go so far as to say an anti-economic system. There's an old saying that the competitive market model seeks to create the best possible goods at the lowest possible prices. This statement is essentially the incentive concept which justifies market competition based on the assumption that the result is the production of higher quality goods. If I was going to build myself a table from scratch, I would naturally build it out of the best, most durable materials possible, right? With the intent for it to last as long as possible. Why would I want to make something poor, knowing I would have to eventually do it again and expend more materials and more energy? Well, as rational as that may seem in the physical world, when it comes to the market world, it is not only explicitly irrational, it is not even an option. It is technically impossible to produce the best of anything if a company is to maintain a competitive edge and hence remain affordable to the consumer. Literally everything created and set for sale in the global economy is immediately inferior the moment it is produced, for it is a mathematical impossibility to make the most scientifically advanced, efficient, and strategically sustainable products. This is due to the fact that the market system requires that cost efficiency, or the need to reduce expenses, exist at every stage of production.
from the cost of labor to the cost of materials and packaging and so on. This competitive strategy of course is to make sure the public buys their goods rather than from a competing producer which is doing the exact same thing to also make their goods both competitive and affordable. This immutably wasteful consequence of the system could be termed intrinsic obsolescence. However, this is only one part of a larger problem. A fundamental governing principle of market economics, one that you will not find in any textbook, by the way, is the following. Nothing produced can be allowed to maintain a lifespan longer than what can be endured in order to continue cyclical consumption. In other words, it is critical that stuff break down, fail, and expire within a certain amount of time. This is termed planned obsolescence. Planned obsolescence is the backbone of the underlying market strategy of every goods producing corporation in existence. While very few, of course, would admit to such a strategy outright, what they do is mask it within the intrinsic obsolescence phenomenon just discussed, while often ignoring or even suppressing new advents in technology which might create a more sustainable, durable good. So, if it wasn't wasteful enough that the system inherently cannot allow the most durable and efficient goods to be produced, planned obsolescence deliberately recognizes that the longer any good is in operation, the worse it is for sustaining cyclical consumption and hence the market system itself. In other words, product sustainability is actually inverse to economic growth and hence there is a direct, reinforced incentive to make sure lifespans are short of any given good produced. And in fact, the system cannot operate any other way. One glance at the sea of landfills now spreading across the world show the obsolescence reality. There are now billions of cheaply made cell phones, computers and other technology, each full of precious, difficult to mine materials such as gold, coltan, copper, now rotting in vast piles usually due to the mere malfunction or obsolescence of small parts which in a conservative society could likely be fixed or updated and the life of the good extended unfortunately as efficient as that may seem in our physical reality living on a finite planet with finite resources it is explicitly inefficient with respect to the market to put it into a phrase efficiency sustainability and preservation are the enemies of our economic system. Likewise, just as physical goods need to be constantly produced and reproduced regardless of their environmental impact, the service industry operates with an equal rationale. The fact is, there is no monetary benefit to resolving any problems which are currently being serviced. At the end of the day, the last thing the medical establishment really wants is the curing of diseases such as cancer which would eliminate countless jobs and trillions in revenue. And since we're on the subject, crime and terrorism in this system are good. Well, at least economically, for it is employing police, generating high-value commodities for security, not to mention the value of prisons that are privately owned for profit. And how about war? The war industry in America is a huge driver of GDP, one of the most profitable industries producing weapons of death and destruction. The favorite game of this industry is to blow things up and then go and rebuild them for profit. We saw this with the windfall billion dollar contracts made from the Iraq war. The bottom line is that socially negative attributes of society have become positively rewarded ventures for industry. And any interest in problem resolution or environmental sustainability and conservation is intrinsically counter to economic sustainability. And this is why every time you see the GDP rise in any country, you are witnessing an increase in necessity, whether real or contrived. And by definition, a necessity is rooted in inefficiency. Hence, increased necessity means increased inefficiency. The American dream is based on rampant consumerism. It, it, it is based upon the fact that mainstream media and especially commercial advertising, uh, all corporations who need this infinite growth have convinced us or brainwashed uh, most people in America and hence the world 
that uh, we have to have X number of material possessions and the possibility of gaining in infinitely more material possessions in order to be happy. That's just not true. So how, why do people continue to, to buy in this way, which is ultimately eco-genocidal in its systemic effects, cumulatively? And it just is classical operant conditioning. You simply put inputs of conditioning into the organism, and you have outputs of uh, desired behaviors or goals or objectives. And it has all the resources of technology and they boast about how they get into the minds of infants. What they hear uh, is already making them conditioned to the brand. Then you see, well, that's how uh, people have been such fools, in a way they've been taught to be fools. It's a value system a disorder. You know, if there is any testament to the plasticity of the human mind, if there is any proof to how malleable human thought is and how easily conditioned and guided people can become based on the nature of their environmental stimulus and what it reinforces, the world of commercial advertising is the proof. You have to stand in awe at the level of brainwashing where these programmed robots known as consumers wander the landscape only to walk into a store and spend, say, four thousand dollars on a handbag that likely cost ten dollars to make in a sweatshop overseas only for the brand status it supposedly represents in the culture or perhaps the ancient communal traditions which increase trust and cohesiveness in society which have now been hijacked by acquisitive materialistic values where now annually we exchange useless crap a few times a year and we might wonder why so many today have a compulsion to shopping and acquisition when it is clear that they have been conditioned from childhood to expect material goods as a sign of their status with friends and family. The fact is, the foundation of any society are the values that support its operation. And our society, as it exists, can only operate if our values support the conspicuous consumption it requires to continue the market system. Seventy-five years ago, consumption in America and much of the first world was half of what we see today per person. Today's new consumer culture has been manufactured and imposed due to the very real need for higher and higher levels of consumption. And this is why most corporations now spend more money on advertising than the actual process of product creation itself. They work diligently to create a false need for you to fill and it happens to work. You know, economists are in fact not a, economists at all. They're propagandists of money value. And uh, you'll find that all their models basically get down to token exchanges that uh, are to the profit of one side or both sides or whatever, but they're completely disconnected from the actually existing world of reproduction. And in Ohio, an old man failed to pay his electric bill. You may be familiar with the case. And the electric company turned off the electricity and he died. The reason they turned it off was because it wouldn't have been profitable for them to keep it on mm -hmm. because he didn't pay his bill. Do you believe that was right? The responsibility really lies not on the electric company for turning it off, but on those of this man's neighbors and friends and associates who are not charitable enough to enable him as an individual to meet the electric bill. Hmm, did I hear that right? Did he just say the death of a man caused by not having money was the responsibility of other people? Or in effect, charity? <laughs> well then, I guess we're going to need a whole lot of infomercials, uh, little miserable coin slot donations for bodega counters, and a bunch of pickle jars for the billion people now starving to death on this planet because of the very system Milton Friedman promotes. Whether you are dealing with the philosophies of Milton Friedman, F.A. Hayek, John Maynard Keynes, Ludwig von Mises, or any other major market economist, the basis of rationale rarely leaves the money sequence. It is like a religion. Consumption analysis, stabilization policies, deficit spending, aggregate demand. It exists as a never-ending, self-referring, self-rationalizing circle of discourse where universal human need, natural resources, 
or any form of physical life supporting efficiency is ruled out by default and replaced by the singular notion that humans seeking advantage over each other for money alone motivated by their own narrow self-interest will magically create a sustainable healthy balanced society there is no life coordinate in this whole theory this whole doctrine what are they doing what are they doing what they're doing is tracking money sequences that's all it is is tracking money sequences presupposing everything that matters. One, that there's no life uh, coordinates. Wow, no life coordinates. Two, that all the agents are self-maximizing preference seekers. That is, they think of nothing other than themselves and what they can get most for themselves. That, that no, that's the notion, that's the ruling notion of rationality. Self-maximizing choice. And, and the only thing that they're interested in self-maximizing is money or commodities. Well, where does social relations come in? It doesn't accept in the exchange to self-maximize. Where do our natural resources come in? They don't accept to exploit. Where does the family come in as being able to survive? It doesn't. Uh, they have to have money in order to purchase any good. Well, shouldn't an economy deal somehow with human need? Isn't that what the full fundamental issue is to satisfy? Uh, human needs. Oh, need isn't even in your lexicon. Uh, you dissolve it into wants. And what is a want? That means money demand that wants to buy. Well, if it's money demand that wants to buy, it's got nothing to do with need because it may be the person has no money demand and desperately needs, to say, water supply. <laughs> or it may be money demand wants a gold toilet seat. Well, where does it all go? To the gold toilet seat. And you call this economics? Like it's really, when one thinks of it, it's got to be the most bizarre uh, delusion in the history of human thought. Now, so far we have focused on the market system. But this system is actually only one half of the global economic paradigm. The other half is the monetary system. While the market system deals with the interaction of people gaming for profit across the spectrum of labor, production, and distribution. The monetary system is an underlying set of policies set by financial institutions which create conditions for the market system, among other things. It includes terms we often hear, such as interest rates, loans, debt, the money supply, inflation, etc. And while you might want to pull your hair out listening to the gibberish coming from the monetary economists, Modest preemptive actions can obviate the need of more drastic actions at a later date. The nature and effect of this system is actually quite simple. Our economy has, or the global economy, has three basic things that govern it. One is fractional reserve banking, but banks printing money out of nothing. It's also based upon compound interest. When you borrow money, you have to pay back more than you borrowed, which means that you, in effect, create money out of thin air, again, which has to be serviced by creating still more money. We live in an infinite growth paradigm. The economic uh, paradigm we live in now is, is a Ponzi scheme. It's n nothing grows forever. It's not possible. As a great uh, psychologist, James Hillman, wrote, the only thing that grows in a human body after a certain age is cancer. It's not just the amount of money that has to keep growing, it's the amount of consumers. Consumers to borrow money at interest to generate more money, and obviously that's not possible on a finite planet. People are basically vehicles to just create money, which must create more money to keep the whole thing from falling apart, which is what's happening right now. There are really only two things anyone needs to know about the monetary system. One, all money is created out of debt. Money is monetized debt, whether it materialized from treasury bonds, home loan contracts, or credit cards. In other words, if all outstanding debt was to be repaid right now, there would not be one dollar in circulation. And two, interest is charged on virtually all loans made. And the money needed to pay back this interest does not exist in the money supply outright. Only the principal is created by the loans and the principal is the money supply. So, if all this debt was to be repaid right now, not only would there not be one dollar left in circulation, 
there would also be a gigantic amount of money owed that is literally impossible to pay back for it does not exist. The consequence of all of this is that two things are inevitable, inflation and bankruptcy. As far as inflation, this can be seen as an historical trend in virtually every country today and easily tied to its cause, which is the perpetual increase of the money supply, which is required to cover the interest charges and keep the system going. As far as bankruptcy, it comes in the form of debt collapse. This collapse will inevitably occur with a person, a business, or a country, and typically happens when the interest payments are no longer possible to make. But there is a bright side to all of this. Well, at least in terms of the market system, because debt creates pressure. Debt creates wage slaves. A person in debt is much more likely to take a low wage than a person who isn't, hence becoming a cheap commodity. So it's great for the corporations to have a pool of people that have no financial mobility. But hey, that same train of thought also goes for entire countries. The World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, which mostly serve as proxies for transnational corporate interests, give gigantic loans to troubled countries at very high interest rates. And then, once the countries are deeply in the hole and can't pay, austerity measures are applied, the corporations swoop in, set up sweatshops, and take their natural resources. Now that's market efficiency. But wait, there's more. You see, there's this unique hybrid of the monetary and market system called the stock market, which rather than, you know, actually produce anything real, they just buy and sell money itself. And when it comes to debt, you know what they do? That's right, they trade it. They actually buy and sell debt for profit, from credit default swaps and collateralized debt obligations for consumer debt to complex derivative schemes used to mask the debt of entire countries, such as the collusion of investment bank Goldman Sachs in Greece, which nearly collapsed the entire European economy. So when it comes to the stock market and Wall Street, we have an entirely new level of insanity born out of the money sequence of value. Now, all you need to know about markets was written in an editorial in the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago. It was called Lessons of the Brain Damaged Investor. And in this editorial, they explain why people with slight brain damage do better as investors than people with normal brain functionality. Why? Because the slightly brain damaged person has no empathy. And that's the key. If you don't have any empathy, you do well as an investor. And so Wall Street breeds people who have no empathy to go in there and to make decisions and make trades that they have no compunction about and no thought whatsoever as that what they're doing might affect their fellow human being. So they breed these robots, these, these people who have no souls. And since they don't even want to pay these people anymore, they're now breeding robots, real robots, real algorithmic traders. Uh, Goldman Sachs and the high frequency trading scandal. They, they put a computer next to the exchange, the New York Stock Exchange. This computer, this co-located computer, as they call it, it front runs all the trades on the exchange and it hits the exchange with, with volumes of orders in ways that scalp pennies and nickels away from the exchange. It just, it's like they're siphoning money all day long. They went uh, one quarter last year, 30 or 60 straight days without a single down day and made millions of dollars every single day. Is that because, well, that's statistically impossible. When I worked on Wall Street, the way it works is everyone kicks upstairs the bribes. The brokers bribe to the office manager. The office manager bribes to the regional sales manager. The regional sales manager bribes to the national sales manager. It's a common understanding. At, at Christmas, who gets the biggest bonus at Christmas in an average brokerage office? The compliance officer. The compliance officer sits there all day long. He's supposed to be making sure you don't violate any of the margin rules and you're complying with the law. Of course, yeah, to the extent that you can bribe the compliance officer, yeah, that's right, you are complying with the law. So how does fraud has become the system? It's no longer a byproduct. It, it is the system. You know, it, it's like an old Woody Allen joke. He says, doctor, my brother thinks he's a chicken. And the doctor says, take a pill, and that should cure the problem. And he says, no, doctor, you don't understand. We need the eggs. Okay? So 
the trading of fraudulent claims back and forth between banks to generate fees, to generate bonuses, has become the, the GDP b producing growth engine of the United States economy. Even though they're essentially trading fraudulent claims that there's absolutely no hope of ever paying back. They're processing and generating and resecuritizing nothing. If I write $20 billion on a cocktail napkin and I sell it to J.P. Morgan while J.P. Morgan writes $20 billion on a, a cocktail napkin and we swap those two cocktail napkins at a bar and we each pay ourselves a quarter of 1% in a fee, uh, uh, we make a lot of money for our Christmas bonus. We each have on our books a $20 billion cocktail napkin, which has no real value until such time as the system is no longer able to absorb bogus cocktail napkins, and in which case we go to the government to get bailed out. And because of Wall Street and the global stock market, there are now conservatively about $700 trillion of outstanding fraudulent claims known as derivatives, still waiting to collapse, a value amounting to over 10 times the gross domestic product of the entire planet. And while we have seen the bailouts of corporations and banks by governments, which of course comedically borrow their money from banks to begin with, we are now seeing attempts to bail out whole countries by conglomerates of other countries through the international banks. But how do you bail out a planet? There is no country out there that isn't now saturated in debt. The cascade of sovereign debt defaults we have seen can only be the beginning when the math is taken into account. It has been estimated in the United States alone that income tax would need to be raised to 65% per person just to cover the interest in the near future. Economists are now foreshadowing that within a few decades, 60% of the countries on the planet will be bankrupt. But hold on, let me get this straight. The world is going bankrupt, whatever the hell that means, because of this idea called debt, which doesn't even exist in the physical reality. It's only part of a game that we've invented. And yet the well-being of billions of people is now being compromised. Extreme layoffs, tense cities accelerating poverty, austerity measures imposed, schools shutting down, child hunger, and other levels of familial deprivation, all because of this elaborate fiction. What are we, fucking stupid? Hey, hey, Mars, my man. Help a brother out, huh? Grow up, kids. Saturn, what's up, man? You remember that smoking nebula I hooked you up with a while back? Uh, listen, Oif, we're getting really tired of you. You've been given everything, and yet you waste it all. You got plenty of resources, and you know it. Why don't you grow up and learn some responsibility, for Christ's sake? You're making your mother miserable. <laughs> You're on your own, pal. Yeah, whatever. Now, all of this considered, from the waste machine known as the market system to the debt machine known as the monetary system, hence creating the monetary market paradigm, which defines the global economy today. There is one consequence that runs through the entire machine. Inequality. Whether it is the market system which creates a natural gravitation towards monopoly and power consolidation, while also generating pockets of wealthy industries that tower over others regardless of utility, such as the fact that top hedge fund managers on Wall Street now take home over $300 million a year for contributing literally nothing. While a scientist looking for a cure for a disease trying to help humanity might make sixty thousand dollars a year if they're lucky. Or whether it is the monetary system which has class division built right into its structure. For example, if I have one million dollars to spare and I put it into a CD at four percent interest, I will make forty thousand dollars a year. No social contribution, no nothing. 
However, if I'm a lower class person and have to take loans to buy my car or home, I am paying in interest, which, in abstraction, is going to pay that millionaire with the 4% CD. This stealing from the poor to pay the rich is a foundational, built-in aspect of the monetary system, and it could be labeled structural classism. Of course, historically, social stratification has always been deemed unfair, but obviously accepted overall as now 1% of the population owns 40% of the planet's wealth. But, material fairness aside, there is something else going on underneath the surface of inequality, causing an incredible deterioration in public health as a whole. Well, I think people are often uh, puzzled by the contrast between the material success of our societies, unprecedented levels of wealth, uh, and the many social failings. I mean, you know, if you look at the, the rates of um, drug abuse or violence or self-harm amongst kids um, or mental illness, uh, there's clearly something going deeply wrong with our societies. What the data that I've been describing does is simply shows that intuition that we people have had for hundreds of years that inequality is divisive and socially corrosive that that intuition is truer than I think we ever imagined there are very powerful psychological and social effects of inequality more to do I suppose with feelings of, inf of superiority and inferiority that kind of division and and maybe going with the sort of respect disrespect people feeling looked down on at the bottom which by the way is why violence is more common in more unequal societies it's the trigger to violence is so often people feeling looked down on and disrespected if there is one principle I can emphasize that is the most important principle underlying the prevention of violence it would be equality. The single most significant factor that affects the rate of violence is the degree of equality versus the degree of inequality in that society. So what one's looking at is a sort of general social dysfunction. Uh, it's not just one or two things that go wrong as inequality increases. It seems to be everything, whether we're talking about crime or health or mental illness or whatever. One of the really disturbing findings out in public health there is never ever make the mistake of being poor or being born poor. Your health pays for it in endless sorts of ways, something known as the health socioeconomic gradient. As you move down from the highest strata in society in terms of socioeconomic status, every step down, health gets worse for umpteen different diseases life expectancy gets worse, infant mortality rate, everything you could look at. So a huge issue has been, why is it that uh, this gradient exists? Totally simple, obvious answer, which is if you were chronically sick, you're not going to be very productive, so health causes drive socioeconomic differences. Not that in the slightest. On the very simple level that you could look at socioeconomic status of a 10-year-old, and that's going to predict something about their health, decades later. So that's the direction of causality. Next one, what's it about? Oh, it's perfectly obvious. Poor people can't afford to go to the doctor. It's healthcare access. It's got nothing to do with that because you see these same gradients in countries with universal healthcare, socialized medicine. Okay, next simple explanation. Oh, on the average, the poorer you are, the more likely you are to smoke, to drink, to all sorts of lifestyle risk factor stuff. Yeah, those contribute, but careful studies have shown that explains maybe about a third of the variability. So what's left, and what's left is having a ton to do with the stress of poverty. So the poorer you are, starting off being, you know, the person who's one dollar income behind Bill Gates, the poorer you are in this country, on the average, the worse your health is. This tells us something really important. The health connection with poverty, it's not about being poor, it's about feeling poor. Increasingly, we recognize that um, chronic stress is an important influence on health, but the most important sources of stress are the quality of social relations. And if there is anything that lowers the quality of social relations, it is the socioeconomic stratification of society. What science has now shown is that regardless of material wealth, the stress of simply living in a stratified society 
leads to a vast spectrum of public health problems. And the greater the inequality, the worse they become. Life expectancy, longer and more equal countries. Drug abuse, less and more equal countries. Mental illness, less and more equal countries. Social capital, meaning the ability of people to trust each other. Naturally, greater in more equal countries. Educational scores, higher in more equal countries. Homicide rates, less in more equal countries. Crime and rates of imprisonment, less in more equal countries. It goes on and on. Infant mortality, obesity, teen birth rate, less in more equal countries. And perhaps most interesting, innovation, greater in more equal countries, which challenges the age-old notion that a competitive, stratified society is somehow more creative and inventive. Moreover, a study done in the UK called the Whitehall Study confirmed that there is a social distribution of disease as you go from the top of the socio-economic ladder to the bottom. For example, it was found that the lowest rungs of the hierarchy had a fourfold increase of heart disease-based mortality compared to the highest rungs. And this pattern exists irrespective of access to health care. Hence, the worse a person's relative financial status, the worse their health is going to be on average. This phenomenon is rooted in what could be termed psychosocial stress and it is at the foundation of the greatest social distortions plaguing our society today. Its cause? The monetary market system. Make no mistake, the greatest destroyer of ecology, the greatest source of waste and depletion and pollution, the greatest purveyor of violence, war, crime, poverty, animal abuse and inhumanity, the greatest generator of social and personal neuroses, mental disorders, depression, anxiety, not to mention the greatest source of social paralysis, stopping us from moving into new methodologies for personal health, global sustainability, and progress on this planet, is not some corrupt government or legislation, not some rogue corporation or banking cartel, not some flaw of human nature, and not some secret hidden cabal that controls the world. It is in fact the socio-economic system itself at its very foundation.